Okay. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say complements what Tom and Dirk have said, but it's slightly different. Um, Fabio this morning said he was a scientist of the past. I think that was unfair. If he's a scientist of the past, I'm a scientist of prehistory, I think, because uh, you can see I've got two affiliations here. One is King's College London, where I was a vascular biologist, uh, but for the last 10 years or so of my career, I've worked for the British Heart Foundation as their associate medical director, and I don't do active research myself anymore, so I'm a fraud. On the other hand, um, I have been doing research for so long that I predate both prostacyclin and nitric oxide, which is quite a long time ago. Anyway, so, onwards. So, first of all, get your PhD. I hope you've all got that, or some of you will have got it very soon. Otherwise, you won't have a scientific career at all. Um, and uh, this is an American cartoon. I don't think it really applies in, in Europe. I hope it doesn't anyway. It gives the impression that you go away and in an ivory tower write a thesis and then present it to your supervisor after three years who says it's rubbish. It takes a lot more iterations in Europe, I think. You still get the comment it's rubbish, but it, you, you, you get it said much more often on the way. So. so why do you want to do research? Answer, because you enjoy doing it even though there are difficulties. Otherwise, don't do it. There are other things in life. So what do you need? You need dedication. You need ambition. You need to do hard work. I don't need to tell you that. You're already doing it. You need to be creative, adaptable. You need to be resilient against setbacks. You just heard from Tom. Your paper will be rejected. Um, and you need some occasional luck. So it's not totally straightforward. This is a rather disheartening slide if you take it in some ways, but not in all ways. It's also slightly out of date. But it makes a point. This is careers in science, all across science, not just bioscience, so it's biased. It's not quite the same in bioscience, which the Royal Society in the UK did about eight or nine years ago. It shows once you start a PhD, just over half of the people starting a PhD then take a career outside science after doing their PhD. So that's half of them gone already. And then beyond that, you have early career scientists who are slaving away to decide, are they going to be the next professor? And you'll see, at least in the UK, something on a 0.5% of what started off doing a PhD are going to end up being a professor. It's not quite as bad in every country in Europe, but there is a very tight funnel. And so there's a lot of dropout. You can regard it as a bad thing. On the other hand, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. At every stage in this career process, there are alternative careers. They're equally valuable. They may be more valuable to you. So don't just start doing a career in research thinking you're going to be a professor. That isn't the only reason for doing it, even though, of course, you'd all like to be one. So what are the upsides? You don't have to stick behind a desk all day, though increasingly I seem to find that all the PhD students and graduate I see are sitting behind a computer all day and not doing experiments, but anyway. Uh, you actually get paid to do something you like doing. You have the freedom to conceive and plan and do what you wish to do. Okay, it's modulated by your supervisor, but you are actually doing it. You're in charge of it. You actually get to places like this, and it doesn't cost you too much money. You go to conferences, you see the world, and more importantly, you meet other people. That's what the most important thing about this meeting is, that you all know each other by the end of it. And you actually build your careers by meeting these people in the future and building careers together, and that's really important. You don't have to wear smart clothes every day, unless you really want to. Um, your mother and your father and your grandfather will think you're a genius, unless, of course, they happen to be professors or geniuses anyway, in which case, tough. And, of course, you might just discover something fascinating or important, which is what we'd all like to do and which we should all be trying to do. But don't be discouraged if you don't always manage it. So what are the downsides? Well, come on, frustration. I'm sure you've all suffered that already. You can spend a lot of time trying to do something and find it doesn't work. And uh, you end up with no results or no useful results over a significant period of time. So that's why you need resilience. On the other hand, a lot of the things you do are repetitive. And actually, you could train somebody else to do it much cheaper, but you have to do it. Pay isn't very good to start with. And you'll all know that you have to work all hours of the day and night and weekends, and you don't get paid a lot, but you do get paid a reasonable amount. And actually, as you grow the career, it does get better. You're not actually badly paid in this career. But the hard bits are funding. 
You're going to have to spend your life writing and rewriting grant proposals. You're going to have to fight reviewers and editors to get your papers published. And then there's this thing about career structure. Well, what is actually a career structure for a basic scientist? How is it organized? How do you get from one place to the next? And I'm not going to solve it for you, and I'm actually going to be a little academic biased, but as I said right at the beginning, there are lots of other ways of thinking about your career which involve moving into industry and back again, or moving into industry and staying there, or doing something entirely different. Uh, Peter has views on that, and you can quiz him, I'm sure, about it. Um, so, so if you want to get a grant to do your research, what do you do? You have to think about what sort of grant you want. That sounds very boring, but actually where would you get the money from? Which funding bodies are there out there that could fund your research and which is most likely to do so in principle if you apply to it? And in the UK, we're fortunate in that there's a very large number of biomedical research funding organisations. You have to think quite hard about which one you might apply to to get your money. In some other countries, the choice is much more limited and basically there's only one or two, so you have to try those. But Generally speaking, you do have to do some thinking. Then you have to say, where am I going to do this work? There's a natural tendency for everybody for their next job to stay where they were when they did their current job. It's easier. It's less disruptive. It may actually be the right thing to do, but it might not be. So if you're actually set about developing a career in research, Think hard about where is it that I can go that I can get the best out of the environment I put myself in to develop my own ideas uh, and develop my career. Have you got the right co-applicants on your grant? Have you got the right collaborators? Reviewers are going to look at grants and say, well, it's all very well that this person has got a good idea, but I, actually they haven't even talked to the person 50 miles away who's got better ideas and actually got better equipment. Why should we fund this person to do this when somebody else is going to do it better? So you have to be aware, you have to be smart, you have to have networked, you have to thought about how it is you optimize the chances that you get funded for what you want to do. Does the project play to your strengths? In other words, does it actually build on research you've already done? Uh, does it show that you're going to use expertise and skills that you already have? Does it also hopefully stretch those skills and expertise? And then lastly, the practical boring thing, rather like writing a paper, it'll take much longer than you ever thought to submit your application. So start writing it early, because applications for grants, unlike writing papers, have deadlines. And if you miss the deadline, you won't be able to do it until the next time round, and that may be six months or even a year later, depending on the grant body you're trying to get the money from. So start early. So government funders... There are obviously state funders in every country. There's industrial funding for research within the academic community, and there are charitable and foundation funding. And again, you need to look through what's out there and what might suit you. And clearly you can get a career based on personal career awards, which is what I'm going to focus on, but also most people in basic science will know very well they spend part of their career actually being a postdoc, working in the lab of somebody else. And that will be on a project or a larger scale program grant. So when you do get the chance to write an application to fund your research, it's a bit like writing a paper. Do as you're told. Read the rules. Don't leave out what's been asked for. Don't submit something that's longer than you're allowed to, or they'll just send it back to you. Don't write things in very small font to squeeze everything in because the reviewers won't like it, or indeed the funding body will just send a thing back to you and say, do it again. And that's fairly obvious because the reviewers who are going to read this aren't paid to do it. They're people like you, and people like me who have even less time to do this. And if we don't see something that's presented nicely, we immediately take a rather bad view of it, even if the science in it might be quite good. So it doesn't help you. So writing an application. Background must provide the foundation for your project and cite previous work that has led you to decide why you want to do this. Analogous to writing a paper, not quite the same, but very similar. It must show why what you're proposing to do is novel, why it's important, why it's worth doing, and actually, in addition to what you would need when convincing Tom about accepting a paper, you have to convince reviewers that you and your group are the right people to be doing this. Hence my comment earlier about, have you thought about the competition out there? Have you found your niche? Are you working to your strengths? Or are you trying to do something which actually, if you thought a bit harder, 
there is no point in doing this because there's a group in San Francisco that's going to do it faster and better than me. So don't do it or else go and work with them in San Francisco and help them do it. So it does help if you show important unpublished pilot data in your introduction or somewhere in the experimental section of a grant application because then it gives some, again, credence to the fact that you have the skills and experience to develop it to do what you need to do in your grant. If you just state you're going to do lots of things with modern technology and you've got no track record of using them, people will be hesitant about giving you money to do it unless you've really got very strong letters of collaboration saying, I've spoken to so-and-so in the next lab or in the next university who promises that I will be trained to do this and they have the right equipment for me to do it. And then the hypotheses that you lay out in your application must be testable, not just vague aspirations. You must, this is experimental science. You have to think how you're testing something. And okay, some science is very generally hypothesis generating nowadays, that's true, but ultimately within it, you're gonna have to test things eventually. You can't just go on generating hypotheses. You have to test things. The aims must be clear, explain what is new. So when you come to writing the experimental plans, they have to be focused, they have to be sharp, they have to be detailed, and they have to test what you said the hypothesis is going, is going to be. And I'll come to an example of that later, a very brief one. It is amazing how many applications for grants I read which have a nice, tight hypothesis that they state, and none of the experiments actually answer the hypothesis at all or try to test it. And you think there's a complete disconnect here. Either it was written by a committee or else somebody forgot what the hypothesis was, but make sure these things work. They run smoothly so that people know about it. We talked about this earlier. Even in basic science, you're increasingly going to have to justify how many animals you're using, the study size, the calculations, the statistics as to how you're going to do the analysis of your results. Otherwise, people won't necessarily trust you to be doing, quotes, reproducible or rigorous research. In clinical studies, you all know this, you have to show recruitment is feasible, you have to have reasonable criteria for inclusion and exclusion, you must have robust outcome measures, and increasingly, as we've heard this afternoon, this kind of robustness in how you design experiments up front and how much you say you're going to do and test it according to what you said you were going to do is going to creep into basic science as well. And I think most importantly, whatever you're proposing to do, you must convince the reviewers that you've chosen the best ways of doing it. And I've hinted at that already. Nobody's going to fund somebody to do something in a second-rate way that is being done better somewhere else. And that may sound harsh, but that's reality. And it may sound difficult, and it is in some countries. It is difficult. And there will be allowances made for this. But ultimately, you should be aiming to try and find, ultimately, the most talented people in the world to convince them that can they help you solve what you want to solve. And in this day and age, global reach out is a lot easier than it was 50 or even 20 years ago to be able to do that. And what you ask for must be achievable. Fellowship applications tend to be over ambitious. People say in five years I'm going to do the following 5,000 wonderful things and so forth. It's good to have ambition but you have to say is that ambition actually something that is way over the top? Think about how long this is actually going to take to do think how much support I'm going to need to do it, and temper that ambition by being ambitious, yes, but not unrealistically ambitious. Otherwise, well, people will say, this is not feasible. Why should we give them the money? They haven't actually thought it through. So writing the application. Reviewers are concerned about value for money, and so be very careful that you don't ask for lots of money without justifying exactly why you want it. The BHF is pretty generous about how it funds grants. Other bodies are less well off and even more penny-pinching about how much you can get out of them. But at all levels, people are going to say, do you really need this? Do you really need another person working with you to do these experiments? Almost certainly you do, but you have to say why. Do you really need this new piece of equipment? Yes, say why. Say there isn't another one in the lab or, you know, whatever. You have to justify things. You can't just write a shopping list. And lastly, appendices and CVs, well, in my view and in the view of BHF, we don't like long appendices to grant applications. The reviewers will never read them anyway, so why write them? Unlike a paper which sits in the literature once it's published and has methods that you can refer to as supplementary material forever, this is not what a grant application is about. 
A grant application is about getting somebody convinced in five or six sides of paper that you can do something fantastic. All the appendices in the world are not going to help that very much. So don't put too many in. And pay attention to your own personal CV. The number of applications I open up, the first thing you do is read the applicant's CV at the back and the last paper on it is 2013 and you think there's something wrong here, they haven't updated it, you know. Or you know they've got two grants and they haven't bothered to put them down or just crazy. That just annoys people. If you, it comes back to Tom's point about not being sloppy. Be crisp. Okay, so once you've written it, you get other people to read it. Really important for a grant application, for a fellowship of any sort, or even a project grant. Get somebody else to look at it and say, do I understand what this person is trying to do? Do I understand why it's exciting and important? And do I believe they can do it? And preferably not just the person next to you in the lab, that they'll be helpful, but somebody actually outside your lab. If they can't understand it, the reviewers may not understand it. So beware. Make sure that generalists can get the point of what you're writing and be excited by it. So, you've submitted the proposal. With a bit of luck, you might get a grant award at the end of the review process, um, which would be good. And you might, therefore, feel rather happy. Sadly, it's more likely to look like this. Um, so, what do peer reviews actually write about grants? Here's some real examples. This project doesn't appear to be hypothesis-driven and is descriptive. How will it shed light on the mechanisms involved? Not very helpful. The application is very ambitious but poorly presented. How will the hypothesis map onto the experiments? Again, what I said earlier. The applicants have done a good job of marshalling evidence in favour of their hypothesis, but they've ignored everything that doesn't agree with it. That puts reviewer X, who actually has the opposite opinion, in a very bad mood when he looks at the grant application, if you've ignored his or her data and it doesn't agree with yours. So don't ignore things. Don't leave things out. The strength of the application is that it's in a relatively under-researched field. Great, this is a nice niche. There's something different here. However, the lack of focus makes me question what we'll know at the end that is novel. So again, be sharp, be focused. This is one about realism, feasibility. If a postdoc can actually do all this, it'd be great value for money, but it won't happen. I have no problem with ambition, but the applicant has underestimated the time needed and the difficulties to do it. So again, be realistic. And a few more examples. Key approaches rely on techniques not established by the applicant. That's pretty damning as well. And it comes back to what I said before. If you propose to do lots of wonderful things and there's no evidence that you either can do them, have done them, or have collaborators that will let, let you learn how to do them, then your application will fail. Here's another one. This is about preliminary data not being adequate. Major shortcoming is that the proposal assumes that alternative RNA splicing occurs, but there's no evidence presented for this. Pilot data is needed to kickstart this hypothesis. The number of applications that come in with what could be superficially, fantastically exciting ideas, and then when you pick through it, you find there's absolutely no evidence to suggest this idea is likely to be right at all. So people then get much less enthused about it, even if it's potentially exciting. Uh, people tend to put in figures in applications for grants which are crammed with data or very small because they have to fit in a space. Don't do that because then the reviewer doesn't understand what they mean anyway. So better to leave them out or keep them simple. And then the project is interesting and novel, but the applicants don't provide any information on how the data will be analysed. That comes back to what I said earlier. You have to say what you're going to do with the results, what they're going to mean, and why they're important, and how you're going to analyse them to ensure that. So... Once you get your review, you probably do this to start with because you're rather irritated with it, but then what you've got to do obviously is sit down, revise, and resubmit. And ultimately, you have a series of very simple things, and these slides will be shared afterwards, so don't write it all down, as to how you get success in writing a grant application. It's all common sense, but you do have to think through it. And for the second part of what I want to talk about is, is specifically about personal fellowships and how, how they fit in and, and so forth. And I, I'm sorry, I'm going to take the BHF as an example because I have to work for it. And we have a lot of personal funding schemes and they maybe more, cover more things than some other people have. But effectively, we as a funding body will fund anything from PhD studentships right up to professors. 
Um, so we're currently funding a few hundred PhD students in the UK. We're currently funding 32 professors, I think. The ratio sounds about right to me. Um, and as a basic scientist, usually in the UK, after you've done a PhD, you'll be a postdoc on somebody else's project grant who supervises you. But then at a certain point, you're going to want to develop your own leadership in science, and you're going to look for an intermediate or a career development fellowship, most people would call them. And in the BHF, we're quite generous. We'll give them for up to seven years. And then hopefully after that, you might get a senior fellowship out of us, which can be renewed every five years, and after that, you might get the chair. And of course, there are ways out of this career ladder at various points. The red lines show going off to academic positions. I could have put in green lines going off to industry or other possible options, becoming the next prime minister, whatever. We need one at the moment. Um, but um, I've concentrated just on that. So it's not necessarily one-way traffic. The other smaller things coming in at the top of the slide we actually have a few other schemes which are designed for various reasons. One is an immediate postdoctoral fellowship, and that is meant to select really a very few each year, maybe a handful of two or three PhD students who've shown exceptional talent and we think are on track to become leaders in the future already, we think, we can identify them. It's very hard to do that. Somewhat judgmental in that actually when you think about it, being a really successful PhD student quite often reflects on the fact you were in a really successful lab rather than you were a really successful PhD student. So it's very hard to choose these people, but they're all interviewed, and we only appoint a very few. Um, advanced training awards are designed for people who want to come into cardiovascular science from another aspect of science, so we can trap more cardiovascular scientists into, into being funded by us. And the career, in, career re entry fellowship is designed to get people back into science who've taken time out for whatever reason whether they've gone and worked somewhere else, whether they've had children, whatever it may be. The other thing about our fellowships is that they can all be part-time. And again, we've done that recently, deliberately, to make it more flexible. So what are the criteria? The immediate fellowships, as I said, are only for very exceptional people immediately after PhD. We insist they get out of where they did their PhD and move somewhere else. Otherwise, they clearly haven't got a lot of ambition. So it's not consolidate what you did in your PhD is to do something completely building on it but different in a new environment so you can build your career faster. And within that period of having that fellowship, we, ex we actually encourage them to say, can I spend a year abroad and say where they're going to do it and why. The career development fellowships, several years postdoc, you're going to have to have first author high quality papers before you get considered for it. You have to begun to identify a research area that you're going to lead in in the future. And again, if you're successful, we'd ex encourage you to spend a period in another institution abroad as part of your fellowship so you can, again, spread what you can do. Senior fellowship is similar but even more prestigious, and we're expecting senior fellows to be appointable as professors by the time they've done five to seven years or maybe certainly within ten years of their senior fellowship. They're all interviewed. If you get an interview, rehearse it get people to tear it to pieces, to ask you questions, to ask you things you hadn't expected, so that when you finally get to an interview, you may not feel relaxed, but you'll feel a little bit more confident that you can answer what's thrown at you. And remember, interviewees, again, like grant application readers, will not be specialists in your field. You're the specialist. You know more than, them and, uh, more than anybody else about what you want to do. That's easy. What they want to do is to know that you can explain it to them and why it's important, why it's novel, and why it's exciting. And that's harder. So what are the criteria for success? Well, clearly between postdoc, PhD to postdoc, you're learning your science, you're developing skills in writing, grants or papers, you're preparing a thesis to begin with and you have to pass it, and you're beginning to publish papers. And then as you go through this career, you're extending that expertise, publishing more papers, developing new ideas, building networks of people that you can collaborate with and look out and get new ideas from and share and build. And then as you get further up this ladder, you're beginning to develop your own research leadership. You're publishing papers as senior author rather than first author. You're getting research grants. You're building a small team. You're raising your profile. You should be nationally known for what you're doing by then and beginning to be internationally known. And you're increasing collaboration to generate results faster and better results. And then by the time you get towards the top of the career, you have to be internationally recognized. You have to have a research team you have to get research grants to support that team. And quite often, if you're a university environment, you have to do quite a lot of teaching and training on top of all that. 
don't forget that. It's important. And finally, as a professor, you have to have a larger research team and do even more. Um, so what that boils down to actually is, you can see there's publishing and grant writing almost everywhere in it, which I said right at the beginning. But what's it all for? Well, basically it's to produce scientific impact. It's also for personal satisfaction, for learning new things, helping your field progress, which are all very beneficial and feel good and important. But actually, ultimately, judging how successful you will be in getting money to continue your career and develop your team depends upon the impact of what you're doing. Now, impact means different things to different people, but it certainly requires, ultimately, international collaboration, high-quality papers, and other things. Uh, those who know what an H index is, I hope most of you do, looking blank anyway. Who doesn't know what an H index is? You all know. Okay, right. So there's an interesting rule of thumb that your H index should be something like two times your postdoc years if you're ever going to get to be a professor. doesn't sound bad until you start thinking about it. It gets quite hard. It means that within 10 years of having done your PhD, you should have published 20 papers that have been cited more than 20 times each, etc. So, um, In the UK, we have a very formal way of expressing impact in research, and it's analyzed at nationwide level, nationwide level every few years. In the next such exercise in 2021, each university is going to submit outputs, that's research papers published by people within the university in different subject areas, so in clinical medicine or basic, cardiovascular, basic, cardio, uh, basic biological science, etc. There's also, they count for 60% of what is estimated. There's something about impact, which in this case means economic or societal impact. It's not academic impact, so it's outside academia. What's this done to drive wealth of the nation, health of the nation, things like that? And what is the environment? How does that contribute to everybody doing well? And what that means is in terms of papers you publish, if you're working at the university, you have to provide papers and they have to compile them. And not every paper from everybody has to be submitted, but quite a lot of them do. And they get scored by a peer review panel. And that's the scoring system from unclassified up to four star. And four star is world leading. Three star is internationally excellent. Two star is recognized internationally. One star is national recognition. And unclassified is worse than that. Doesn't sound too bad, except that the university gets money from the government based on this assessment. That's what it's all for. And if your publications are not better than two star, they don't earn any money for your university. So there's a huge pressure in the UK to publish quality, not quantity, and get it better. And it actually worked for the first two or three rounds of this exercise. Uh, it did push up quality. It's now getting quite difficult, I think, to know what to do next. The other thing it is doing, and it isn't just this that's doing it, but the drive for impact, I was thinking earlier this afternoon, it does make team and large-scale science, A, more imperative because you can do more in large networks and with collaborators and do better, but it also makes recognition of your individual career as you grow in science harder because you're going to be part of a bigger team. So that's something to balance and for both you and the people who fund you to think about. <coughs> you can forget this. This is, this is a careers in science group, uh, lobbying group in the UK called VITI. And they have this wonderful wheel which says not, you, you don't just have to do science, you have to do all these other things as well. They're all the soft skills you need to start gaining as you develop your career. It's A, illegible, and B, don't worry about it. So good luck. Um, this is what tends to happen. I think this is actually a wonderful uh, way of doing things if you read it carefully. Um, Tom, have you tried this for anybody yet? Um, it does save a lot of hassle. Uh, but still, this is Snoopy in his writing days. Uh, if you get to the fourth one, you'll work, you'll work out it is very funny. Um, so here's our rejection slip for this manuscript and for the next one. So. Right, any questions for me? Um, we have a little bit of time, otherwise we'll run a poster time. Uh, I can think of a few if you want any, but uh, anyway, so all yours. Thank you. There's one there. Yep. 
and I might bring in either of our other two speakers with this session if it's more appropriate to get a, a combined answer. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, so I read somewhere that uh, grant reviewers, they award lower sco uh, scores to proposals from women compared to men, even if they don't know the gender. The thing is that uh, when women write their proposal, they are more cautious in their statements and um, using more specific terms, whereas men can sometimes mm -hmm. use broader terms mm -hmm. and can actually overstate their performance in a test. So is there any solution you can think of which can help uh, women? I'm not the only person in the world trying to solve this, as you know, oh. and I, I, I don't have a, a full answer. But um, <laughs> the point is correct, uh, and there are differences in the way in which women approach life entirely, but anyway, but certainly in terms of science and writing applications and so forth. And I think it's probably true to say that on average, women are more cautious about what they write, uh, it's certainly true that men more often will apply for jobs they know they haven't got a hope of getting just to see if they get it. Women don't do that nearly as often. They'll, be, they'll do an awful lot to make sure they're really suitable for the job and think very hard about it before they apply. But the way I think we have to do this to get better at it, and we try hard at the BHF, we're not very good at it yet, but that's what all organisations is doing, is to ensure that the way in which applications are reviewed is as far as possible evenly balanced between men and women, so that the women on the panels and the women who are reviewing actually appreciate this and actually affect what comes out of it. So that's one way anyway. Thank you. Next. There's one there. Um, I'm uh, Ansar from Iran. I had a question. I'm a cardiologist. Um, I'm like, I, I like, uh, um, like clinical science more than basic science, but I wanted to get to know to basic science yep. as well. But uh, I, I dedicate myself to heart failure and imaging as a whole. But I, I wanted to have your suggestion and advice. So for applying a PhD on these subjects, do you think can I integrate both together or should I study them separately and, have, and then have them together after my studies? So, so what were the two subjects? Uh, and, uh, imaging and heart failure. You could combine them, certainly. Yeah. Depends where you do your PhD. And you could actually do a perfectly good PhD in some aspects, which is entirely clinically based and using clinical imaging, as long as it's being analyzed in an innovative way or using new technologies for imaging or whatever, that's fine. Or you could actually take time out and go and work in a lab where you're doing preclinical imaging and applying it to heart failure models. And again, I mean, that's what my advice would be, but there are other ways that one could do this. So chat to other people later on. More questions? You know the answers to all those, do you? Good, right. Uh, <laughs> yep, there's one there. So I got inspired by your questions. Uh, my question is, can you successfully do science and raise a family? Sorry, can I? Uh, I can't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you can, and it, it harps back a little bit to the question we had before. I think there is there's a really increasing need and recognition, but it hasn't got there yet, that career pathways for women in science in particular, but it also applies to men to some extent, because of family um, commitments, need to allow flexibility. So it depends being really clear that women and men, if, if appropriate and if they want to, um, they probably should, share maternity, paternity leave, that there is flexible working. Ideally, I think the best way of solving this, which very few universities have done is, well, that's not true, quite a lot have, but quite a lot haven't, even in the UK, is to ensure that there is good childcare at the place where you work. And that doesn't happen nearly often enough. That would solve a lot of the difficulties, I think, uh, and it really isn't done enough. I mean, that sounds glib, but it actually is important. But the way we try to approach it as a funder is to say that we will always be flexible in the hours people want to work, whether they want to work part-time in whatever it is they're doing, we will, we'll accept that. Um, as long as they tell us why, we'll also always allow, for example, in fellowship, if you, dis if you take paternity or maternity leave in the middle of the fellowship, you will have the option as to what you want to do with that grant. You can keep it running and you can keep the, the research assistant or the postdoc on the grant doing the work. 
and we just then don't pay you because the government pays you when you're on paternity or, or, paternity or maternity leave and you actually carry that over to the end of the project or you can do other you, we try to do whatever is suits the person best within what we can do legally so we're trying we're not perfect but you know yeah one there Uh, after my PhD, should I stay in my own lab? That's okay. Complicated one. I think it, there may be divided views here, and I don't know what the faculty think. We have to bring some of them in. I think I have usually been of the view that you should move, and the reason for that is that your training and research is, which is what it is, doing a PhD, is a very good grounding as to whether you have the aptitude, the capacity, the desire, the the, the whatever to go on doing research and building your own career, but that stage of it isn't actually doing that. It's just learning how to do it. And if you stay in the same place, you won't learn much that's new because you're stuck in the same environment. And er the earlier in your career you do move to broaden your environment and to get new ideas, the better it's easier then than later in your career. It's not impossible, but it's probably the most obvious time to do it. And so that's what my view would be. I don't know what others' view is. There are re you could say there are reasons why you do want to stay in the same place. And that's coming up more often than it used to, I think. And it's partly because to get a paper published in, let us say, Cell, you've done your PhD over three or four years. You've actually got three quarters of a Cell paper. You haven't even got the paper yet. <laughs> Science is getting harder. And actually, there are quite good reasons then for saying, I want to do my first postdoc in the lab where I did my PhD, because I want that cell paper. I don't want to write and, and put it into a lesser journal, just because I haven't got time and my lab is not going to pursue it afterwards. So there are good reasons sometimes for staying. There are also reasons if you have got a very clear idea that you've built on your PhD, which has been quite successful, and you've got specialized access to equipment or samples or something in that university, then stay. But I think on balance, if there's no compelling reason like that, you do better to move somewhere else, new horizons, new experience, broaden things. What do other people think? Blank. Okay. Any more? Silence. Well, I think, are we supposed to look at posters now? Is that right? Yeah. Tell me. Do we get a drink if we go and look at a poster? Oh, right. So this is an opportunity then for us to hang around and talk to each other, begin this networking, get to know each other, get to know us better, ask anybody anything you like. And then, uh, Gemma, do you want to remind people about what's happening this evening? Yes. Um, uh, very quickly, it, it's Hangover there, the eight groups that have been uh, created according to balance in gender and country of origin and all that. So, uh, first of all, please, which is your group you're going to uh, be playing tonight? And the second is that uh, buses will take us from here directly to the, to, our, to, the, to the hotel in the beach. Then you will have to walk by to your hotel at night, so that's up to you. But the first stop will be in the hotel, and there we'll move to the beach. And after this, when, when we reach there, I went yesterday night, and it was empty, and it was Sunday, so probably today being Monday, it should be empty. Hopefully, it will be more empty. So, it will be all of us, or the 62 of us, which I'm very happy to announce, the 62 of us will be uh, starting the quiz. I have the copies with me. I have all the material ready, so we'll be able to, to, to start when we arrive there. The most important is if by any chance there is another party over there, then we should perhaps move a bit to the beach. Yeah? That's, that's the point. But it's sunny and it's warm and that's not going to be. We're going to take a micro with us, so take a jacket or whatever. So I also have, I also have the, the vouchers for the drinks. So I thought there were going to be less people. So now I'm so sorry to tell it's only one drink for each of you. And oh. all the uh, faculty members, no drinks. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> only for you and I. But, uh, <laughs> 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 okay. okay, so that's it. Okay, so when we arrive there, bus how will be leaving just, at seven. Just, just for information, how many of you have tried to get into the middle of Nice? Have you, have you, from where you're staying, have you done that yet? Yeah. How did you do it? Bus. 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 Very wise. Do not get a cab. 
A, there aren't very many, and B, they are astronomically expensive. <laughs> Even if you put five people in one, which the driver doesn't like, it'll still cost but you, you know. there is Uber here. <laughs> yeah, he, yes, there is Uber here. Uh, the taxis like Uber drivers even less. There is also, of course, near your hotel, a thing called a tram. There is a tram. And the tram goes right to the middle of town. So, anyway.